Hello and welcome to the final episode in this series of Business Agenda SA. And here's what's coming up on today's program. There are big dollars to be made in South Australian tourism if you know what to offer. Yes, sir. El Ansari shares the Institute of Chartered Accountants Australia's vision for the future of the country. And Justine Norby finds out how recent changes to our workplace health and safety laws will impact your business. We live in a state blessed with great food, great wine and great landscapes. But how do we compete with world famous travel destinations like the Great Barrier Reef and the Sydney Opera House and get people to holiday right here in South Australia? We did some investigation and found out that offering an experience is key. The experiential tourist wants a holiday that will enrich, entertain and even educate. South Australia is well equipped to deliver and a large number of homegrown visitors are coming to the state to take full advantage. The domestic market represents about 86% of our expenditure income. So visitors from the eastern seaboard, from Western Australia, they're an absolutely crucial part to the tourism operator. And I think it's important that anybody looking to get into the tourism market be very clear and consider what the domestic market means to them in the first instance. And when it comes to providing that all-important experience, offering something your customer wants is key. The Sticky Rice Cooking School in Stirling has done just this. We started off with a hands-on cooking school and that's pretty much all we concentrated on, doing the Asian cuisines. We listened to our customers and we've since diversified into other cuisines and also we've added some new villas now, so we've got the accommodation side of the business as well. We did go for uh, the quality end of the market. That was quite important to our existing customers of the cooking school. They certainly were looking for that sort of experience that they might not get elsewhere. We service um, the whole of the CBD, people in Adelaide, the suburbs, and then interstate travellers are obviously coming uh, for longer periods and that's where they can stay now with us and also explore the region. And we're here in the Adelaide Hills and it's a beautiful region and we've got food, wine and uh, wildlife here. So nature-based holiday seekers often come and just do the cooking school as an aside. The Sticky Rice Cooking School is a great example of a product that's also developed to meet growing needs of, of emerging markets. They have developed product that is based on consumer demand. And I think that's a good example, consumer, what they want and meeting that demand and matching it with their product. While the domestic market accounts for the lion's share of the state's tourism income, there are huge opportunities emerging along with China's changing demographics. It's the fastest growing uh, middle class anywhere in the world with China. Now that means there's uh, estimated to be 400 million middle class Chinese within 10 years. Now they will travel and they do like to travel. Now if Australia could get 1% of those, that's 4 million uh, Chinese visitors coming to Australia. In total Australia only uh, receives around 6 million tourists at the moment. So you can imagine what can happen if that came into the market. Uh, it would be fantastic for Australia. Now our challenge in South Australia and Kangaroo Island is how do we actually capture them? What are the things they're really interested in and how, how can we deliver a terrific product to them? The type of visitors that we're targeting out of China are the more sophisticated independent travellers. Why? Because that's what we are as a destination. Food and wine is very important to them and these are big opportunities that South Australia needs to recognise and needs to deliver on. And they will buy expensive bottles of wine and go to great restaurants. The other areas of focus for us as an opportunity are our wildlife, our nature. There are only three other places in the world if you want to swim with a shark, you can do that. One of those is here in South Australia. But also our nature. People can interact with it in a really accessible way. But what about the language barriers? There are South Australian businesses that already cater for our Asian neighbours. The central market is a good example of a product that's really adapting and meeting the needs of an emerging market like China. So they have uh, developed language tours, Mandarin, where they actually take the visitors around and give them that real experience in their own language. It, it allows the visitor to have a greater depth of the experience when their English is not great. And I think this is something that's really crucial if we as a state are, are to have strengths in particular areas. And that's where, as the South Australian Tourism Commission, we're working to work with industry and really upskill, make sure the product is right to meet this growing demand. The South Australian Tourism Commission has also been working to grow transport capacity into the state. 
We've seen airlines like Emirates come to the state. We've seen Singapore Airlines recently increase their flights to 12. And we've also seen the announcement of AirAsia X. We've got Cathay, we've got Malaysian. What that essentially is doing is opening up the state internationally and we've also seen a growth in domestic capacity as well. That's up 11%. So from a point of driving business into the state, we've got the factors right. Increased capacity will actually mean more people will come to South Australia. I think on top of that, you know, China is, uh, is the fastest growing. Europe and the UK is our largest market, so we must not forget that. And recent trends from that market have actually shown that we're now receiving great growth again. It has been a difficult time while we had a strong Australian dollar, but that's turned and we must uh, remember that that is our biggest market. I mean, then it's, it's about the Chinese market. Um, you know, what we can actually do with them, where we can take them and what can we show them. So with everything in place to attract and accommodate visitors, it's a great time to be starting up or growing your business in this vibrant sector. Next up, our innovation destination. And according to Joran Roos, you don't have to spend a lot of money to be innovative. Companies sometimes are a bit worried that embarking upon a journey of innovation is going to be costly. And not all innovations have to be costly, although some can be. Creating value you do by using science and technology, and that can be risky, and that can take a long time. But you can also use things like design, the ability to create an object that when you put it to use, it makes you change your behavior, and your new behavior makes you want to spend more to the benefit of the provider of the object. You can use things like emotions, the ability to change the emotional state of somebody so that they behave in the way you want to, the way I make you hungry in the grocery store by letting some of the bakery air into the air conditioning system so it smells some newly baked bread and you want to buy more. You can use art, the ability to have objects that are considered to be beautiful, for example, in luxury goods industry where you pay a hundred times more than the cost for a certain handbag. Uh, and, of course, those all create value. Then you need to appropriate the value so that your customer doesn't take it. And part of that is with business models. And a good business model is one where you make more money as a profit than you have revenue from your primary offerings. And that's the, the, the real crux of a good business model. And the final one, of course, is to be able to deliver value to the customer in terms of what they value, because it's not only about functionality. They can be about perception, they can be about beauty, and they can be about what other people think about the object that I own. So all of those are possible, and not all of them are costly, and not all of them are risky. So you don't have to start with the most costly and most risky of them all. For more information, go to demita.sa.gov.au. Coming up after the break, we meet Yasser El Ansari from the Institute of Chartered Accountants Australia for an insight into their plan for Australia's economic prosperity. Business Agenda SA is proudly brought to you by ANZ, the Institute of Chartered Accountants Australia and Warman's Lawyers. Chartered accountants are well respected for their exceptional thinking and understanding of all things business. So when they put their collective resources together to write a report on the future of Australia, everyone took note. We sat down with the Institute's Yasser El Ansari and found out that there's no time for complacency if our economy is going to continue to prosper. Well, Future Inc. for us has been a long time in the making. It was originally born out of a session that we held with our board to talk about the big challenges confronting our nation in the future, the big shift that's occurring in our demography, uh, the ageing of the population, and the impact that that's having on our economy. We spent some time talking about what we should do about that. How can the Institute make a positive contribution to public policy debate to try to position Australia to be stronger in the future? With an extensive amount of work behind this initiative, how and why did the Future Inc. report come about? 
We've been hearing from our members for a few years now about the, the pressure points in the economy. They are very good at telling us uh, what's happening out there. Accountants touch around 95% of all businesses in this country, and that's a tremendously valuable insight into what the mood is. Around about half of our members work in businesses um, across Australia as well, so they are CFOs, they're CEOs, uh, they're finance managers. They're also a tremendously valuable uh, portal for us into what the mood is and what's happening out there on the ground in the real economy. As to Future Inc's findings, there have been a number of worrying issues raised. Well, some of the big issues that confront our nation are issues that we, uh, from time to time uh, here in Australia, we've talked about, but we haven't really done much about. Um, issues like our infrastructure deficit, $770 billion worth of infrastructure deficit that we somehow need to tackle. And we're not just talking about roads here. Uh, we're talking about investing in roads, absolutely, that's part of the equation. Uh, but we need to look at capacity right across the spectrum. We need to make sure that we can train kids, uh, educate kids, um, to be the strong uh, leaders and the strong contributors to our economy in the future that we need them to be. Uh, we've got an ageing population, kids are one way of helping us uh, address that problem and circumvent the challenges that arise from that. Uh, but we need to invest more in all of our infrastructure, including ports, including rail. Uh, including our transport and infrastructure networks um, for air travel. Um, all of those pressure points are critical because they all go to the one issue and that is building capacity for our future. And as for the good news, the report has also identified a number of opportunities for Australia's economic development. Australia has a tremendous opportunity over the next few years to position ourselves in the Asian marketplace uh, much more prominently than what we are at the moment. Uh, we've got some catching up to do and we've got some relationship building to do, but it's so important to our future prosperity that we can't afford not to do this work. Um, we need to go to Asia and we need to talk to them about what they want from us. The conversation needs to be about how Australia can make those nations more prosperous and the contribution that we make will in turn make us a stronger economy. Future Inc has identified four key platforms they believe the new federal government should focus on over the next few years. The first one relates to fiscal sustainability. What we're really talking about here is making sure that our budget finances are as healthy as they can be. Over the last few years, the previous government was fixated on returning the budget to surplus by a particular point in time. In the end, they had to abandon that commitment because the Australian economy wasn't moving in line with the projections uh, that the government had expected. Um, but what we're saying in our paper is that we ought to aspire towards restoring the budget's uh, finances. We need to make sure that we don't jeopardise the strength of the Australian economy in getting to that point. The second platform in our paper is about international best practice. There's a renewed focus making sure that we don't forget the lessons of the past few years during the worst of the global financial crisis. But we have to make sure that the pendulum doesn't swing too far on this. Um, we don't want governments and capital market regulators to interfere too much in business activities. The third platform in our paper is about boosting productivity and productivity here in Australia has been a frontline conversation for a long time now. Uh, we need to do something about it. We need to take big steps towards providing more flexibility in our workplace. Our industrial relations laws are part of that. But we also need to ensure that businesses have the right frameworks in place to allow them to get out and recruit and hire and engage new labour. One of the other parts of boosting productivity is making sure that we continue to incentivise older Australians to make a contribution towards the workforce and our economy. Um, when you get out there and you talk to older Australians, they want to keep working, they want to keep making a contribution and we ought to make sure that we've got the policies in place that incentivise that to happen. The fourth platform in our paper is about effective and stable financial markets and this is important because we've seen during the worst of the global financial financial crisis, the impact of instability abroad, what that means for Australia. Uh, every Australian who's in the workforce or who's, who has recently been in the workforce has of course a superannuation balance. Whether they recognise it or not, each and every one of those people is a shareholder in our capital markets. We all have an interest and a stake in making sure that our capital markets continue to be as stable uh, and prosperous as we can for the future. We're really proud of the work that we've done. But it's a long journey, we've got more work to do and we're really committed to making a positive contribution to public policy debate to help everyone in the community uh, develop and, and contribute to a much stronger society in our future. For a full copy of the Future Inc report, go to charteredaccountants.com.au forward slash Future Inc. Coming up next, Justine Northey takes a look at health and safety at work and the stark consequences for those who breach the law.
Welcome back to Business Agenda SA. With recent significant changes to Australia's health and safety laws, is it business as usual or will companies have to make significant changes to the way they operate? Whether your workplace is big, small or anywhere in between, workplace health and safety is essential to both understand and implement in your business. But where do you start? We went to the experts for some advice. One of the key changes in the new laws is the move away from the traditional concept of the employer-employee relationship. And the new laws move to a concept of what we call the person conducting a business or undertaking and the worker relationship. The definition of worker has now been expanded to include not just the traditional employees, but independent contractors, volunteers and the like. And that's really important because the Act specifically says that where effectively you have dealings with a contractor, that obligation can now extend to them as well as though they were an employee. So I guess the key issue with that is that the legal status of the relationships, whether they're an employee, contractor, doesn't matter anymore. Complying with the new legislation may not be at the top of your to-do list, but when you look at what's at stake, it should be. Under the new legislation, now individuals who are involved in a significant breach of the legislation uh, face the risk of jail time and significant fines. You know, everybody has a right to work in a safe workplace because when things go wrong, um, people can in the extreme lose their lives. I think people sometimes forget that at the end of all this proverbial red tape, there are very significant and very real consequences if things go wrong. Another key change is under the old laws, we used to have what we call the responsible officer who was appointed to take responsibility in effect for health and safety within a business. The new laws recognise that safety should really be a shared responsibility and so anyone who's operating at that officer level should share the responsibility. We've developed a small, hopefully simple, uh, pamphlet for a particularly small business to use which identifies seven steps to creating a safe workplace and to navigating your way through the laws. One of the basic messages we would get across in our little pamphlet is talk to your workers, involve them, and also keep work health and safety at the forefront of your mind. Safe Work SA have a very key role in, in educating SMEs and they do a very good job of it and resources such as that are a really handy tool um, for employers to actually um, you know, go to the website, access that information when needed. And it is a good website, they have some very handy resources. What I would add to that though is that um, it's important I guess to, to supplement to that general assistance with specific advice wherever possible, particularly if you don't have any existing policies or processes or training then it actually is best, at least initially, to obtain formal advice that is tailored specifically to your workplace. People often ask me why it's so important to obtain legal advice uh, with respect to work health and safety. And at the end of the day, it's an incredibly complex uh, and technical area of the law, but um, it is a criminal um, offence, so we must ensure that we get it right. Don't let your workplace or your employees suffer from a lack of compliance. Remember help is at hand and the experts are just a phone call away. For legal advice on the new WH&S legislation go to walmans.com.au So Cameron, clearly businesses have always been concerned with the health and safety of their employees but it seems the screws have really tightened now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, small businesses may not have the resources that some large firms do, but they really need to understand that this is something that they do need to pay attention to. Mm. All right, coming up after the break, we're back in the new media jungle with Pracky. Business Agenda SA is proudly brought to you by ANZ, the Institute of Chartered Accountants Australia and Warman's Lawyers. With Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube to name but a few social media platforms, it seems there's barely enough time for face-to-face -face contact these days. That's right, Belinda. But love it or loathe it, social media is here to stay. But what's the next big thing? What is the next big thing in social media? Instead of answering that, I'm going to pose my own question. Why do we even care? We know that there are 13 million Facebook accounts in Australia and 9 million Aussies hop onto Facebook via their PC every day. 
and 7 million Aussies visit Facebook via their mobiles every day. There are 3 million LinkedIn accounts here and an estimated 2.2 million Twitter accounts in Australia. It can feel like new social media tools are being invented all the time, because they are, but so many are launched to great fanfare and crossed fingers, only to be abandoned months later. Our most popular social tools have had incredible longevity and stability. Facebook has been publicly available since 2006. It's the world's dominant social network and, love it or hate it, it continually reinvents itself and doesn't look like letting go of its lead anytime soon. Yes, there are some tools that seem to leap from nowhere, like Instagram and Pinterest. A lot of Australians have fallen in love with these image-sharing tools. But like the cliché overnight success of a rock band, Instagram and Pinterest weren't popular overnight. It took them a few years. The social media world is more stable than you might think. My advice is know your target audience, know your own capability and your brand, and focus on the online tools that suit both. Focus on how social media might help you conduct your business, not on the buzz around the latest thing. Don't get caught up in the hype. Whether you're a regular tweeter or not, we encourage you to join in on the Business Agenda conversation using our Twitter handle at BizAgenda. And you can add us as a friend on facebook.com forward slash businessagendaessa. And episodes and other information can be found at businessagenda.tv. Well, that's it for the first series of Business Agenda SA. We hope you've enjoyed our behind the scenes look at doing business in this great state of ours and meeting the entrepreneurs that are driving it forward. Don't forget to catch up with us online where we'll continue to post South Australian business news and information. And you can help me to outdo him in Twitter followers by finding me on Twitter at Belinda Hagen. And never want to shy away from a challenge? You can search for me under my name at Cameron England. It's been a pleasure bringing this program to you. Thank you so much for your company. Goodbye. Goodbye.